The person I'm going to be talking to is currently the head of presidential school here in Bukhara. Uh, he's also involved in a bunch of different projects. He runs his own English school, and he used to work at one of the private schools here in Bukhara. So he's got a ton of experience about education, uh, IELTS, English, and knows a lot about SAT as well. During that season, uh, even our academic directors uh, the deputy directors used to call me to deliver some of the some of our classes. Mm -hmm. uh, while with, they were away in the cotton fields picking cotton, right? You'd yeah. be teaching their class on their yeah. behalf. Good old days. I was one of those super lucky guys. There were like 20 scholarships available and I got the 20th. The scores were available on the internet, but I didn't see that because I was really afraid. It was 7.5. Wow. <laughs> Without any preparations. Without any preparation for the IELTS exam. Uh -huh. After this podcast, I bet kids are going to start doing the same and <laughs> drop, out, drop out here. And I finished four questions in nine hours. I did four questions from that book in nine hours. I started at nine. I finished at 6 p.m. Uh, how hard would you say the math part of SAT is, like on a scale 0 to 10? It is competitive. Mm -hmm. It is more competitive than mm -hmm. most of the universities in Uzbekistan. Our statistics is that mm -hmm. 24 students are accepted out of 3,000. Out of 3,000? Candidates. And in percentages, that roughly how much is it? It is 0. 0.0... Something. Okay. And that's less 0. than... 0. 0.008? That's less than 1%. Less than 1%. A guy spends his high school years doing calculus, advanced math, mm -hmm. and then a few years later, he's in his cubicle using Excel mm -hmm. for addition, multiplication. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was one of the options was Ad Astra. Oh, really? Yeah. Right. Who came up with that idea? My, my sister-in-law came, uh -huh. came up with that idea. This is Mike Chuck. Mike Chuck. We are shooting episode number 40. 40 episodes in. That's insane. I guess we're live. Hey folks, hey everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Adostria Muse. I'm your host, Muhammad Ali. Uh, on today's episode, I'll be talking to another brilliant guest. Uh, the person I'm going to be talking to is currently the head of presidential school here in Bukhara. Uh, he's also involved in a bunch of different projects. He runs his own English school and he used to work at one of the private schools here in Bukhara, so he's got a ton of experience about education, uh, IELTS, English, and knows a lot about SAT as well. So if you guys are interested, please keep watching. All right, now let me introduce you our guest today. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to Mr. Oybek David Khajayev. Mr. Oybek. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm really uh, honored to uh -huh. be um, member of this project, I mean, to be, to be participating in this project. Uh -huh. uh, thank you very much for inviting me to mm -hmm. this uh, interesting podcast, and mm -hmm. I hope my experience will be uh, useful for your and our followers. Yeah, right, right. Usually, I get guest suggestions from our followers in the comment section, and sometimes they personally reach out to me. I don't know how they get a hold of me, but, but I'm guessing uh, they got connections, they talk to people, and they got my contact. And uh, so I guess it was one of your students or one of the presidential school guys who told me that I should, I have to have you on the podcast. I'm like, yeah. And it's like, he's super interesting. He's got, he's got all these cool things going for him. Uh, we want to hear more from him. And I got super excited about that as well. So I started digging. I started talking to people, and I finally decided to reach out, and we're making this happen. Mm -hmm. right. okay. And Thank you. thanks a lot for coming to the podcast today. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you like to tell our audience a little, about, little more about yourself? Um, okay. So, so as you know, as you told, my name is Oybek David Khajaev, and I was born in Bukhara. Uh, I... Uh, studied at school number 30, uh, 32 mm -hmm. and uh, graduated from the Economical and Banking College in uh, 2014. Mm -hmm. And then I applied for the, the Westminster International University in Tashkent. And I, I studied there with a scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Grad, yes. Uh -huh. uh, I graduated from... The university in 2018, 
And uh, during my studies there in 2017, I uh, went to the United States, mm -hmm. if it's interesting for mm -hmm. the follower. Oh, we'll be sure to follow up on that real quick. Uh, and uh, when I came back here, uh, my teacher, Mr. Firdaus Nauruzov, was uh, opening the first private school in uh, Bukhara. Mm -hmm. So I uh, participated in this project and I worked at the Knowledge Academy private school mm -hmm. and I worked in his mm -hmm. uh, language center. Mm -hmm. uh, then in 2019, uh, mm -hmm. I decided to open my own mm -hmm. language school. And then uh, I ran it for a couple of years in, in 2021. Uh, they invited me uh, to the presidential school in Bukhara as a math teacher. Mm -hmm. And then I became the business teacher and then I became the school counselor. And now I ended up <laughs> being the principal. And, and then later here on the podcast. Yes. Yeah, here you are. <laughs> here, this we're is having this for now my last destination here. <laughs> right. Right. So you just put out a lot of information about you. Now, what do you say we step back and, uh, you know, st start from the very beginning, your like high school, high school life. So what, what was Mr. Oybek in high school like? Oh, uh, in high school, I was one of the brilliant kids and I used to be the a uh, course representative mm -hmm. in my class and mm -hmm. uh, I used to be the, mm -hmm. the head of the students in the school. Mm -hmm. So you were one of those straight A students, yes. right? Straight A. Right. And, and involved in a bunch of different projects as mm, well. Yes, so, so you, yes, yes. And we, I uh -huh. participated in different types of Olympiads, mm -hmm. maths and physics. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... I, I studied English well at school, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't think I, I, I uh, would be, I, I didn't used to think that I would be uh, an English teacher one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And what got you interested in math? Math. My uh, supervisor, our, our class supervisor, uh, used to be a, the math teacher, and she kind of was one of the reasons that mm -hmm. I got interested in mm -hmm. in maths. Uh, you know, when uh, uh, my my teacher wasn't available, I used to deliver her classes. How old were you at the time? Sixth grade, seventh grade. Sixth, seventh grade boy. Uh, I used to teaching a class. I used to teach grade five, grade my my classmates. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow! Wow! And you know. There, there was. There used to be mm -hmm. cotton season, uh, mm -hmm. cotton picking season, right? Yeah, back in the day, I yeah. remember those days. That you cannot yeah. hide that. Uh, during that season, uh, even our academic directors, uh, the deputy directors, used to call me to deliver some of the some of our classes. Mm -hmm. oh, while with they were away in the cotton fields picking cotton, right? You would yeah. be teaching their class on their yeah. behalf. Good old days. <laughs> Good old. <laughs> right. Right. And you think you've always been mathematically inclined? Like you think you you have a, you have a, some talent for it? Or is it something you developed over time through labor, through work? So how does math come so easy to you? I, I would say uh, both. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there were some brilliant students uh, who did... I mean, who could understand mathematical topics with very little effort, but uh, I mean, whereas I, I had to put a lot of uh, energy to learn that topic. But uh, with both talent and uh, hard work, I think then uh, I got really interested in math. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I learned math, and, and at the end, I started to teach math. Right. And you said you took part in some school Olympiads, right? Yeah, in physics. It, not math, though. Not, not math. No, I mean, uh, for math, mm -hmm. uh, I, I couldn't reach the, the I mean, uh, the Olympiads, uh, the pr 
to to the so you weren't level uh -huh. or province level, but in physics I went up to the province level. Mm -hmm. I mean uh, I didn't attend any special courses. Just I uh, my my physics teachers were really, mm -hmm. physics teacher was really good, mm -hmm. really good. Right. She is one of the best teachers uh -huh. I've ever seen. Like that makes me really wonder why you did not decide to major in physics and mathematics when you were in university, right? You studied business instead, right? So was it like a, uh, did you like make a sudden, did you have a sudden change of mind at the time or you thought there was, there, there weren't many prospects in physics and math? So There was and there is uh -huh. still, uh, but you know, I was interested in, in physics. I didn't see that as a main or as a major to to study. My real, uh, I mean, I, I really wanted to study at Westminster International University and mm -hmm. there was not any physics mm -hmm. exam, so I didn't study. Well, why not go to Inha University in Tashkent? Oh, I, I don't think computing is my... But I'm guessing they, they have physics major as well. No. Yeah. I Because I, I... I remember when I was uh, prepping for my university admission, I had a bunch of friends of mine who were doing math at the time and they were brilliant in physics as well. So they they applied for scholarship at Inha University, which required math, physics, and English. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I... Oh, you didn't think see, of it at the yeah. time. I... I um, my, my, both of my parents used, I mean, they still work uh, in a bank and I wanted to, to work in a bank mm -hmm. in the beginning, back in those days. I see. Uh, and I didn't see myself in engineering or any other sphere where, mm -hmm. where physics is involved. Mm -hmm. I just studied math mm -hmm. and studied uh, English mm -hmm. and I, I really wanted to study it mm -hmm. wide. And do you regret that choice? No, at all. No regrets. So if you could go back in time and do it all over, you would not change a thing? I would still choose Westminster International University. In and choose to study business. Yes. Yeah. Not economics, but business. Yeah. Because sometimes, I honestly, I went to the same university, by the way, and I did get a scholarship as well, mm -hmm. right? But I was one of those super lucky guys. There were like 20 scholarships available, and I got the 20th. <laughs> you studied on scholarship as well? Yeah, yeah, I got the 20th. Anyway, and, and I, I did, did talk about it on the podcast before, how I got lucky with that scholarship. So I'm not going to go in detail here. But sometimes I sit and think to myself how my life would have been different if I had pursued uh, science, if I had pursued uh, computer, computer science or physics, like one of those hardcore subjects, not humanities, mm. right? Not social studies like economics. And economics is, if you think about it, as a branch of social studies. It's not exactly exact science because there are so many theories, yeah. right? Uh, there is a little bit of math there, yeah. But still it's not as hardcore as you, those exact sciences like math, computer science. So I really wonder what my life would be like if I was a computer engineer or a software developer, mm -hmm. something along those lines. So do you ever think about that or you don't really have time for this? <laughs> uh, no, uh, I think uh, whatever has happened, they're all for good. Uh -huh. you know? And I did not regret it uh, because uh, both of my parents were uh, and mm -hmm. are, uh, they have been and are uh, still supportive. Uh, and they respected my choice. Mm -hmm. They respected my decision. They respected my decisions. And uh, even though uh, when I was applying for that university, they... Uh, so they were supportive. They, they didn't have a second thought about my uh -huh. choice. Just they trusted me. Uh-huh. And I thank them. I thank them uh, because they were mm -hmm. uh, supportive. Mm -hmm. And I tried to be mm -hmm. like them to support my kids. Mm -hmm. Right.
And what was your preparation like leading up to the moment when you got scholarship? Like uh, the standardized tests like IELTS or SATs, if you did any SATs at the time. So what was your prep like? You said you... It was uh, stressful enough, you know, because uh -huh. uh, if I think mm -hmm. about the decisions I made in those days, mm -hmm. uh, you, you would you, you will think that I'm, I I was a very crazy person <laughs> <laughs> because um, I, I my my math was good enough to do the tests uh, and I did ninety if I'm not mistaken ninety two percent out of one hundred wow uh, and get, guess what I got I got forty seven <laughs> and miraculously got in <laughs> miraculously forty seven forty seven scholarship out of out of hundred. You cannot because that's that particular year when I applied for a scholarship at that university at, at Wyatt, they math questions were super tough. Mm. They we had been preparing for logic questions like you did because mm. uh, the the Wyatt this university has reputation for testing students on their logic and their critical thinking and problem solving. So we'd been doing a bunch of those logic questions, and we ended up getting. Uh, different, tr types of different types of questions, trigonometry. Uh, in 2016? Uh, 20, 2017, sir. 2017. Oh. Sir, trigonometry, we had some questions on calculus, which was a total you shock. On the, on the computer, right? Huh? You did the test on the computer. No, that happened a few years later. Oh. Yeah. yeah, at the time it was still paper, and we did it in, in their sports hall. Yeah, mm -hmm. they had everyone go inside. It was a large crowd. Yeah, we sat there for two, three hours. And um, when I when I when I looked at the question booklet, my just shocked washed over my face, and and I I had calculus, I had trigonometry, and I and I'm trying to solve as many questions as I can, but I know I screwed up big time. Right, the moment I step out, I I start asking other kids how they did, and they're all telling me it was awful, it was terrible, even the smartest guys who went mm. there. And I, I had a moment of relief. <laughs> mm. I was relieved that I wasn't the only guy who screwed up. So that gave me a little bit of hope, mm. right? And so that year, the highest math score was 66%. Oh. Highest. Then yeah. it's quite mm -hmm. tough. Yeah. yeah, that was quite tough. I, I think that my IELTS saved me. Yeah. If it wasn't for my eyes, I would have flunked for sure. So you applied with uh, eight, seven point five at the time. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah it was. My, my my decisions were really crazy. Um, in I applied for that university in twenty fourteen, and I had the IELTS with six point five, and I, I I got it in January twenty fourteen, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and then um, I asked my parents to uh, let me study. Uh, at the Westminster International University on um, contract based mm -hmm. uh, so that I could go to the United States. Mm -hmm. you know, it was a little difficult mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, students who studied on scholarship to go to the United States. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my father uh, was telling me, okay, I could only study at Westminster, uh, Westminster University if I had the scholarship. And then I had to retake the IELTS. And in April, I registered for the IELTS uh, in July. You know, uh, back in those days, uh, you could only re take the test every three months because they didn't organize uh, every, every week or every day, just like mm. these days. And IELTS was not that popular, so they organized every two or three months. And uh, I registered for the IELTS exam on July the 12th. I remember the day because it's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and f I, I had three months to prepare. But you know uh, how it feels like when you're 19. So uh, I... Were you taking a gap year at the time? No, I, I didn't get a gap year. I, I was uh, kind of released from everything, and I thought uh, I knew math very well, and I thought that three months would be enough to prepare mm -hmm. for the IELTS exam, and I 
you know, the time passes, time passes, and look, uh, I had only a couple of weeks left for mm-hmm. the exam. I, I didn't prepare anything. Mm-hmm. And when I was registering for the uh, university, I registered as a student who doesn't, who didn't have any IELTS certificate. Mm-hmm. So it totally, uh, uh, it, it was totally connected with my uh, that score, mm-hmm. which I haven't hadn't taken yet. Mm-hmm. So you promised them to offer your certificate later after yes. the test, yes. which and that option is available. For those students who don't know, I guess you don't have to hand in your you IELTS certificate. Just show the right registration, uh-huh. uh, the screenshot, mm-hmm. and then uh, you can provide the IELTS certificate a little later. Mm-hmm. So uh, I went to the uh, exam mm-hmm. on the 12th of July with my friends, and I took the test. And after the test finished, uh, I went out and said, "Ah." Oh, what have I done? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I had a feeling that uh, I would be lucky if I had got 6 or 6.5 again mm-hmm. because I didn't have any preparation. Mm-hmm. And then after 13 days, on the 12th of, at uh, 25th of July, I, uh, it, that was the last day, the deadline for the application for the university, and I had to come to Tashkent to get my certificate. Mm-hmm. Uh, the scores were available on the internet, but I didn't see that because I was really afraid. Mm-hmm. And when I opened uh, my uh, certificate, it was 7.5. Wow. <laughs> without any preparations, without any preparation for the IELTS exam. Uh-huh. But I, I, I read a lot of books uh-huh. uh, during the spring. Mm-hmm. I, I read a couple of Harry Potter books, mm-hmm. Lord of the Rings. I watched Friends, Big Bang Theory. Yeah. And I understood that they helped me a lot. Uh, with 7.5, I, I went crazy. And uh, there were only two uh, students uh, among the candidates who got eight. Mm-hmm. The rest were 7.5 and 7. Mm-hmm. And with that, I got the fifth uh, place mm-hmm. in the list. Mm-hmm. And I got the scholarship. Wow. But that was, uh, the 7.5 was a gift, you know. So uh, that progress, one point jump you made over the... From January to yeah. July. Well, right. Was purely from uh, just reading, and reading a bunch of books and, and watching, watching movies and TV shows. After this podcast, I bet kids going to start doing the same and <laughs> drop, out, drop out here. They have to do it right. Yeah. I think they, they shouldn't, I mean... You shouldn't be too, I mean, too obsessed about this, but uh, what I believe is in, in between January and July, I understood that uh, learning a language is not just uh, reading the course books. It's just learning the culture, learning uh, uh, to be, I mean, to, to think in that language. Mm-hmm. So I think that happened to me. Mm-hmm. Right. And in my mock exams, I couldn't do seven point five in reading. Mm-hmm. I couldn't to tell you to tell you the truth. But in the exam, within one hour limit, my reading score was eight point five in those in, in, in that exam. But in in my mock exams or in my free reading tests, uh, I couldn't do. 7.5 for 8, mm-hmm. uh, even in one and a half hours. Right. I don't know what happened on that day. Mm-hmm. So I always say it was a gift for my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So do you think a lot, of, a lot of the students who are learning English right now make the mistake of obsessing with IELTS textbooks and rarely do any reading for pleasure or rarely do any watching, viewing for pleasure? I mean, like, useful content outside the classroom, right? Do you think that's the mistake they're making? They well, do. Uh, what I think, uh, so, I, I, I call you Muhammad Ali, so, right? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Muhammad Ali. What I think uh, is that learning a language shouldn't be, like, 
six month or nine month period. Mm -hmm. It sh I mean, the more you learn, the more you understand that you know less mm -hmm. in language learning process. Mm -hmm. uh, these days in my language school, people come and ask me to prepare them for the IELTS exam in three months or five months or six months, mm -hmm. or they, they, they come uh, and ask me to teach them to speak within a couple of months. And I, I do not, I, I, I tell them I, I wouldn't teach them. Why? Because in, in two months, you cannot learn anything. I mean, in language learning process or our vocabulary with those people, like learning a language is different. For me, learning a language is different terminology. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I mean, what I believe is learning a language should be a long process mm -hmm. so that the more you learn and mm -hmm. the more you remember, the more mm -hmm. you, the more it lasts, you know? Mm -hmm. but you learn it a couple, couple of uh, terminology and a couple of phrases and after a couple of months you forget them. Mm -hmm. So you have to watch movies, you have to read, you have to do karaoke. Right. So you would advise parents out there who was watching this podcast to let their kids start learning English early on, or whatever language is. Yes, the sooner language, the better. I think it, it should be at least two, three year process. Mm -hmm. At least. Right. And not show up at the, at the last minute, yeah. wouldn't they? So grade 11 students come in, they yeah. ask me to prepare for the exam. So how can you prepare them uh, without knowing their talent without knowing their capabilities. Mm -hmm. Right. So you need to allow long enough time, long enough period for language to set in. Yeah. So for not just the language itself, it's uh, the culture surrounding if, it, the concepts. Want, uh, right. Quality. Mm -hmm. process, if you want quality learning. Right. Well, quite interesting. Uh, how, how about your... <laughs> SAT preparation. You, I know you are also involved in SAT, right? Did you do the SATs before the uni admission, or you got interested? You got into SAT afterwards. Um, so where does SAT fall on this timeline? Or you know, SAT exam was not as popular as mm -hmm. it is right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I used to help uh, some of my friends, acquaintances mm -hmm. who were preparing for the SAT exams. I used to help them uh, to solve some of their math questions. Uh, and then when I came here uh, to, to the presidential school, uh, I became the coordinator uh, in the Bukhara region um, to organize the SAT exams. Uh, now I can uh, no, I, I, I organize the SAT exams uh, for the SAT preps. I mm -hmm. can help with the math part. Uh, English is also, English part is also interesting, but I believe the English part needs a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. Because the question types are really different. It, they are interesting, but uh, different types of questions, totally different types of questions. Mm -hmm. So you would say... SAT English is a lot harder than IELTS English, right? Um, that gives you the feeling mm -hmm. that they are hard, but uh, I would say they're interesting. I did a couple of questions in English part. Uh, you know, you have to read the questions uh, two or three times to understand the gist, mm -hmm. to understand the meaning, you know? They are interesting. Mm -hmm. So they involve logics, they involve critical thinking, uh, punctuation and everything. So the questions mm -hmm. are really different from the questions in IELTS. Mm -hmm. Interesting, though. Have you done any English part? Yeah, yeah, I did. Actually, I tried some of the SAT questions and I got 8 out of 10, but not 10 out of 10. <laughs> yeah, see, some, somewhat you, tricky there. I did 4 or 5, but uh -huh. I did them all. Uh, but uh, I haven't taken the mm -hmm. SAT Seriously, the English mm -hmm. part seriously. Yet. Math, good. But uh, not taking the 
uh, the English part seriously. All right, then let's focus on the math part of SAT. So uh, how hard would you say the math part of SAT is, like on a scale zero to 10? And what, what, does, what does it usually cover? That do you have calculus, trigonometry on the math section of SAT? Or is it just all uh, fifth to ninth grade math? Uh, the math part is fairly easy. Mm -hmm. um, with our national curriculum, I would say grade, it involves the topics from grade 5 to grade 9 mm -hmm. uh, based on the Cambridge curriculum. So, you know, we have uh, lower secondary, mm -hmm. IGCSE, and AS and A levels. Mm -hmm. So it covers the lower secondary and um, IGCSE levels, mm -hmm. which are quite easy. Mm -hmm. So you can prepare for the math part. If you do not, let's say, uh, if you do not know math, mm -hmm. you just uh, graduated from high school and mm -hmm. you're preparing for the SAT. So um, you can prepare for the math part in for, for around five to six months. Mm -hmm. But still, based on the student and how he or she is interested mm -hmm. in math. Right. We teach... Uh, pre-SAT and SAT here at Ad Astra, and the program duration is usually nine to four months. So nine months if uh, they have uh, zero to some, some to zero, little to zero math background, and four months if they have decent math background. So how do these numbers sound to you? Good. Would you say they are reasonable? Nine to, f nine to four months, good. Mm -hmm. Nine to four months. Yeah. You know, even though you know the the topics in uh, our national curriculum, still the question types are different. Mm -hmm. So what they ask in the exam is really interesting, and the questions are made by uh, real professionals, and, and you feel it, you know, because uh, the questions they ask, they do not ask you to... Uh, do some simple calculations. They ask you to think. So this is what is interesting. And they, uh, the questions check the logics, the, even, the, even the critical thinking. So they're interesting. So you have to prepare. The more you prepare, the better you score you get. Mm -hmm. So if I'm an SAT student, mm -hmm. what are some pro tips you would give me to say level up my preparation to take my preparation to a whole different level what are some pro tips you'd have or some do's and don'ts okay uh, the first thing my first uh, piece of advice would be to those who are interested in taking the SAT to learn English very well at least to the C1 degree Mm -hmm. level. Do not start preparing for the SAT without learning uh, English. So in IELTS terms is 6.57, right? At least 7. At least 7. At least 7. Uh -huh. Because uh, the reading and writing part in the SAT is really difficult. And to understand the questions in, in mathematics part also needs high level of English. Mm -hmm. How about the math part? Math part, uh, if the student knows mm -hmm. the language very well, mm -hmm. uh, he or she can learn the math part in English. Mm -hmm. But uh, if the student uh, is doing both, then I would say mm -hmm. to learn math in their uh, native language, mm -hmm. Russian or Uzbek in mm -hmm. our case. And then... Uh, turn to the math part, but uh, the best advice would be to learn the uh, the English language well yeah. first, and then uh, learn mathematics in English. Learn mathematics mm -hmm. in English. because in that way the student will be able to think and analyze the questions in English. Mm -hmm. If I want to self-study SAT, what are some online platforms or tools I have I can use w there without is without teachers' assistance? In Windows operation system mm -hmm. called Blue Book, mm -hmm. so you can practice uh, there 
and uh, you can find some free online sources on the internet to practice and for math part I would suggest to use the Panda math book so this is also good I can mm -hmm. share the PDF file yeah that'd be great yeah uh, this is an old book but mm -hmm. still very useful uh, and of course if the students are learning uh, math in English mm -hmm. I would share some vocabulary mm -hmm. with mathematical terminology mm -hmm. right well, things like even numbers prime numbers yeah. integers right know what they are how they're different and, and still you know the, the students who are doing Cambridge curriculum will find uh, it useful because some of the terminology in Cambridge math and American math uh, are different for example gradient and slope they're mm -hmm. the same thing, mm -hmm. but in uh, Cambridge curriculum, it's called gradient. In American mathematics, it's called mm -hmm. slope. And SAT is an American standardized test, so then kids should learn the American terminology, not the British. So only presidential, presidential school kids would have trouble because uh, they are taught the British curriculum and mm -hmm. asked to sit the American standardized test. When, when I used to teach math, uh -huh. um, I, I used to tell them, the differences, mm -hmm. uh, the the terminology. I mean, differences in the terminology. Uh, I don't think it, it will be difficult. It just you have to learn. Mm -hmm. We have some of the words we we call in Bukhara different, mm -hmm. and in Tashkent different, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing. Right. So the so dialect varies depending on the region. Yeah. Clear, right? And how do you think this? new SAT format, com computer SAT, different from traditional SAT? I do not have any experience in the traditional paper-based mm -hmm. SAT exam. Oh, you've never done it before? No, no, no. no. Right. I haven't taken the SAT exam. Uh -huh. But you do, I'm guessing you must have done some old SAT questions, right? I did. All yes. textbooks. So yes, how, do they, how do they compare to recent questions so students are getting on computer test, computer SAT? Because I hear they're a lot easier. They are a lot easier, yes. Mm. They are much easier than the questions mm. before. So I help mm. some of my acquaintances uh, to prepare for the exam. Mm -hmm. And they took the SAT in 2014, 15, 16. Mm -hmm. The questions uh, now are a lot easier than those questions, mm -hmm. which were given in 2016, 2015. Mm -hmm. but uh, what I remember uh, from those uh, days that the, those questions uh, demanded the candidate to do a more calculations. But this ones, mm -hmm. even though they're easy, they uh, require you to think. Mm -hmm. Right. And why do you think they ma they made that change? They decided to dumb down some other questions, make them easier. Because the students are getting dumber. <laughs> the calculations might be easier. Yeah. Uh, uh, as I told you. So they require to think. So some of the answers, uh, y you, you can find some of the answers with, uh, you know. With ease, instantly. With ease, but you have to think uh -huh. to, that, to, that, uh, to get the answer, you know. Mm -hmm. Without thinking, mm -hmm. uh, without, mm -hmm. uh, how to put it. So, so you, you can't simply just apply the concepts you learned in class. You, you need to be able to creatively... Yes, you have to be creative. Yeah, creatively yeah. manage to yes. come up with the solution, try different approaches and see what works and what mm. doesn't. So you can't just use a template you yes, got exactly. taught at school. It's not just like using the formula and coming mm. to the answer. Yeah. It's, you have to think creatively mm -hmm. and you have to come to that answer. You mm -hmm. know? It, after you do this, you... you uh, feel kind of satisfied yeah, rewarded I'd say satisfied, yeah. yeah you feel rewarded and, and satisfied right you feel accomplished yeah. accomplished yeah. like you cuz you got you got something mm -hmm. big done <laughs> right right yeah, I remember those days too when I used to do math questions I'd be spending sometimes hours just trying to uh, 
to get crack it. yeah crack one question or one equation and when i would finally come up with the answer on my own i'd feel like top of the world yeah yeah i know that feeling mm. yeah uh, uh, i used to do when i was preparing for the math exam i used to do skanavi book uh-huh by a russian uh, oh i know that book i know that that book is a real uh, brain challenge yeah it, it is a ch- challenge it's a real mind wrecker Uh, the questions there are so I'll tell you one thing uh, from my experience with that book one day it was mm-hmm. during my holidays mm-hmm. and I started doing mm-hmm. uh, some of the questions from uh, geometry part from that book mm-hmm. I set I, I, I started doing that at nine o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. And I uh, finished four questions in nine hours. I did four questions from that book in nine hours. I started at nine. I finished at six p.m. At six p.m. And I I filled two forty-eight page notebooks, mm-hmm. and I. Only did four questions, but I felt so satisfied uh-huh. because they were real, really uh-huh. difficult questions from that book. But I did that. <laughs> I, all those hours spent on cracking only four questions. So, you know what? Sometimes when I see, when you see writing, writing. Yeah. What's crazy about math is we spend all this time learning equations, formulas, and spending even more time solving problems. What happens later on is you end up getting a job where you don't need any of those formulas and you end up using Excel sheet. <laughs> you ever seen that meme online? Uh, a guy spends his high school years doing calculus, advanced math, mm-hmm. and then a few years later, he's in his cubicle using Excel mm-hmm. <laughs> for uh, addition, multiplication. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, and that, 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 that's actually true because I spent a great deal of time when I was in high school learning all these equations and formulas. Now for work, I only use Excel, yeah. right? Even for simple th- stuff like addition, subtraction, multiplication, right? Okay, what I see, mm-hmm. how I see mm-hmm. math is, is that uh, it's, it's not something that you do when you're working. Um, math, as I see, is the practice for the brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people say that, yes, the, 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 the physics we learn, biology we learn, chemistry we learn, because they, are, uh, they, they exist, right? The chemicals exist, the organisms, or the planets. But uh, people created math, mm-hmm. and they created and they learn it themselves. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, what I see in math is that math is the practice for the brain. The more you do, the sharper you get. Mm-hmm. Uh, the better you understand the other things. So this is how I see. It's like solving puzzles, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when you solve Cross puzzles. Words or, you know, the puzzles like Sudoku. Mm-hmm. So this is how I see. And I do not regret my nine hours mm-hmm. for four questions, and I do not regret uh, all my four years of uh, pre- preparing for yeah. math exam, you know, because they helped me a lot in, in life. They helped me a lot in uh, solving the problems in life. So with those Uh, efforts that I have made uh, I think I learned to find solutions to the problems in life mm-hmm. you know it's like uh, there they say there are two types of people so uh, one type reminds about the problem others solve the problem <laughs> so I think math kind of helped me to be a mm-hmm. problem solver right right problem so you used think we still need to learn math however challenging it is even with all these supercomputers and calculators we have now i mean look at chat gpt now it can do it can do all the all the math problems for us it can write code 
it can create, design, invent, but right? ChatGPT is mm -hmm. the product uh, produced by people. Mm -hmm. So to be able to control that, to be mm -hmm. able to use that efficiently, I think you have to know. And even even the ChatGPT, if you if you give the right prompt, you can get the right answer. If you give vague on questions, and you'll get vague answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That makes sense. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. All right, going back to your SAT coordination, what is it like setting up the SAT exam? Like, if I, if Edestra wanted to become a registered SAT exam center, well, what are the steps we would have to take to to to, to, to be eligible? Mm. to earn that title. Yeah, we did that in the presidential school in Bukhara. We did that with the help of our agency, mm -hmm. Agency for the Specialized Institutions. Uh, and if, if you write to ETS uh, that conducts different types of exams like TOEFL, SAT, GRE, mm -hmm. uh, you if, you, if you contact them and if they find you eligible, you provide them with uh, with the documents of your school mm -hmm. and your policies and everything, mm -hmm. and you should have the uh, enough furniture, uh, everything they need. Then you uh, w uh, you move through uh, like two or three months process of registration. Mm -hmm. They ask you. Uh, to fill some documents and you do, you fill, and then you might be chosen as the SAT test center. You said ETI, right? ETS. ETS, what does that stand for? E I don't remember. E exam testing system or something? Can I? Yeah, sure. Well, we can look it up real quick right here. You said ETS, right? ETS. Interesting ETS. acronym. ETS, ETS meaning. ETS. So, Educational Testing Service. Educational Testing Service. Founded in 1947, is the world's largest private educational testing and assessment organization. It's headquartered in Lawrence Township, New Jersey, but has a Princeton address. Cool, yeah. ATS. Right. So, they're responsible for nearly all standardized tests, including SAT, GRE, GMAT. Most of tests, yes. Right. GRE, GMAT. Mm -hmm. And so your school, the presidential school, earned that title, right? Yes. So you guys had to go through something like a lengthy process, yes. fill out documents, and exchange emails back and forth, yes. and finally... You have to provide uh, responsible people's mm -hmm. uh, contact details, mm -hmm. and uh, one person for the coordinator and two mm -hmm. people for, I mean, to, to back up the coordinator, mm -hmm. so when he or she leaves the job. Mm -hmm. We're starting to seriously consider possibly including SAT as, uh, the, as one of the services or products we offer here at, at Astra because we see there seem to be a lot of interest for SAT. It's kind of a new fad now, right? Mm -hmm. Kids getting SAT, great SAT grades, six, 15, 20. Uh, there's a kid who got 1540 from Bukhara. There's a kid who got 1560, one of our former SAT teachers. Mm -hmm. and so I, yeah. I kind of see it as a new opportunity, new market. There is going to be a very uh, huge demand for the SAT in the mm -hmm. coming couple of years. Mm -hmm. And good luck with that if uh, you need any help mm -hmm. from my side. Uh, I, 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 I would be... Happy to, to help you. Oh, I appreciate yeah. that. Thanks a lot. That means so much to us. Now, what do you say we talk a little about your university experience, right? So once you had got into university, you decided to study business as major, right? And you also told me earlier on the podcast today you went to the U.S. as part of the U.S. work and travel exchange program. So what was that experience like? Uh, okay, uh, let's start with my major first. Sure, sure. After the foundation mm -hmm. uh, foundation course, uh, I chose to study business because that course um, I heard that was easier to study. <laughs> <laughs> so you picked that option because it was easy yeah, enough because it was hard. I, I, I was going to study economics. Uh -huh. but, uh, I didn't. I, I 
chose not to study there because uh, the the students from previous from uh, uh -huh. previous years they they failed a lot of exams. Uh -huh. In Tashkent, I promised to myself that I uh, need to be I needed to be uh, self sufficient and I needed to be uh, self financed. You know, so I decided not to ask for any money from my parents and. Uh, and I do not regret that I made the right decision. I uh, and I, I I chose business to balance my studies with work, mm -hmm. you know? uh, and that's why I chose business. And business was a quite an interesting mm -hmm. uh, field of study. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 2017, I went to the states. Mm -hmm. So, what was that experience like when you went to the U.S.? Right. Actually, I started to uh, I, I started the work and travel exchange program uh, in 2016, but uh, I chose the wrong person to work with, mm -hmm. and I lost my one thousand wow. dollars. Wow. Others, my uh, one thousand dollars because I borrowed that money from my father. Uh, and so you mean like the agency you signed up with? Yes. Agency yeah. that helps he, with your he, documents. He wasn't a, mem a member of mm -hmm. uh, any agency. He was just a liar. Mm -hmm. And he collected money from 50 to 80 people. And he gave us the false documents, uh -huh. false DS. And we were lucky enough not to enter the embassy with that false document because, you know, they do not tell you whether your document is false, they just reject, mm -hmm. and then uh, you'll be in there. Blacklist. Blacklist, and <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, you will not be able to get any uh -huh. visa. And then we, we found out about the false documents at the gates of the embassy, mm -hmm. and then we didn't enter the embassy. And how, how did you realize that? Did someone tell you that the, those documents um, were a counterfeit? We found out that all of our documents were with the same QR code and the same barcode. Uh, they were just copies yes, of one just thing. Copies, and what I noticed is that, you know, we use A4 paper, mm -hmm. and the size of A4 paper is different from American uh, B4 paper. Mm -hmm. So they use B4 paper. Their their size is different. Mm -hmm. And I said, it. Uh, I, I knew that. And I told my friends that it. Uh, there, there, there was no way that it came from the United States because mm -hmm. they do not use A4 paper. Mm -hmm. And then we found, everyone found out that they had the same QR code mm -hmm. and just they were false papers signed by that man. Mm -hmm. Oh, that year... Uh, Must have been we all <laughs> lost the chance to go to the States. Yeah. And then I told my father that I lost my, uh, I mean, his $1,000. Well, uh, right. And then I asked for well. some more money. <laughs> he, uh, I refused to give. And then I uh, lived with my, uh, my best friend, my teacher, Mr. Abos in Tashkent. Mm -hmm. He helped me a lot with the finance mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that in, in, in during my third year at the university I did not know how I spent that time but I went to the to the university and I went to work went to the university went to work mm -hmm. so I worked from uh, I, my, my daily routine started at around 7 30 in the morning and it finished at 12 mm -hmm. right? So I worked in two different jobs. Mm -hmm. so I, I taught English and mm -hmm. math, and plus I worked as in the publishing uh, agency. Agency, yeah. yeah. We used to print books. Uh -huh. And then I tried to save some money for uh, the job offer, for the insurance. I mean, mm -hmm. my main goal was to go to the States. Mm -hmm. And then in 2017, uh, only my mom and my teacher knew that I was, again, uh, preparing my documents to go to the United States. This time I didn't tell my father. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell any of my friends. Mm -hmm. The previous one I told everyone. Mm -hmm. And I failed. Mm -hmm. So everyone was asking me, oh, did you go to the United States? No. 
mm-hmm. and I was really tired of those questions. And mm-hmm. I this that in the second time I didn't tell anyone. Mm-hmm. And then I prepared all my question uh, uh, the documents, and uh, in March I got my job offer at a Mexican restaurant, and then uh, in at the beginning of May I. Uh, entered the embassy, and my experience in the within the embassy was uh, <laughs> kind of stressful, you know. So there were three people who were giving their visas: mm-hmm. uh, one young man, young lady, and mm-hmm. and old women. Mm-hmm. So you know, you come within a line, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, the candidates, I mean, the mm-hmm. people go. And, Three different ways. Mm-hmm. So the young man and the young lady were giving the visas. They were like with happy faces, mm-hmm. and I saw in 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 the in the windows. But the whoever went to that old lady mm-hmm. uh, kept getting rede- were being rejection, rejected. right? And I was hoping not to go to <laughs> to that lady, but it, uh, mm-hmm. at the end of the line. So the 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 the, the two mm-hmm. young people were uh, busy with the people, and she was the old lady was uh, free, and and I said, okay, whatever I have done, so I've done everything correctly. So whatever happens, if it's uh, in my fate mm-hmm. so I'll go if it's not then I will not mm-hmm. so I went to that lady and the, the old lady didn't look at me at all mm-hmm. so she was asking me like where are you going and I said I'm going to the states mm-hmm. and she was like where are you going to work I said I was going to work at a Mexican restaurant and she asked me have you tried any Mexican food <laughs> <laughs> and I now I understood that at that very moment uh-huh. I needed a little joke uh-huh. to to the right level uh-huh. so that we had a warm uh-huh. conversation and I said, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> and she started to smile uh-huh. and she gave her first visa, you know, <laughs> that day yeah. to me. Yeah. And, then, and I was very happy and the first person I called was my mom, uh-huh. uh, and the second person I called was my father. Uh-huh. I called my father, father, I, I, I got my visa now, can you borrow me $1,000 <laughs> to, to get my tickets? You know, uh-huh. at that time, you couldn't buy. And I, I, I think it is still, you cannot buy the tickets if you do not have a visa to the States, right? No, I don't think so. Not that. I, because I remember, I remember exactly. Oh, that, that actually depends. I guess that depends if you have connections at the at the tickets office Mm -hmm. because I remember my dad got me my flight tickets before I got my visa Mm, good and that was a that was a big big bet bet we made because if I wasn't going to get my visa I wouldn't be able to refund all my money Mm -hmm. I I would not be able to get all my money back Mm -hmm. so we I remember we had to put like $200 on the line Mm -hmm. I I bought my tickets Mm -hmm. after I got my visa Mm -hmm. and I flew to the States we actually uh, we were going to rent uh, an apartment with two of my friends, two group mates. Mm-hmm. And we paid $50 mm-hmm. uh, before we went to the, uh, to the States. Mm-hmm. And on the day we uh, landed in New York, we called the lady uh, from whom we borrowed, uh, from whom we, are, we were going to rent an apartment. Uh, she said she gave away the room to the girls, and we were homeless <laughs> on the first day in the airport. <laughs> but luckily, we uh, had a good taxi driver mm-hmm. who took us to Delaware directly mm-hmm. from uh, New York, and he found an apartment mm-hmm. for us. But in that apartment, uh, they said they were going to expect 12 more students. Uh, and I said, I, I couldn't live with 12 more students in three-bedroom apartment because you have to use one bathroom. Mm-hmm. And we tried to find, we, we, we spent another three days to 
uh, find another apartment. And luckily, we found another one just 40 meters from the Atlantic Ocean, from the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, and six of us lived there mm -hmm. with two uh, students from Turkey mm -hmm. and one from Macedonia and mm -hmm. two group mates. So all of us were. Mm -hmm. And I started my job uh, at the Mexican restaurant called Dos Locos. Mm -hmm. Too crazy. It sounds very Mexican. <laughs> Um, and then uh, I, I my, my job offer uh, in my job offer my job was written as a waiter mm -hmm. but they didn't get me as a waiter they mm -hmm. didn't hire me as a waiter because I didn't know the the ingredients in the food and mm -hmm. so um, I had to work as the assistant to the chef I mm -hmm. prepared the salads and then I tried to find uh, a job as a waiter, but I mm -hmm. couldn't. So I uh, found another job after after twenty days. I, I you know I, I found jobs for my friends mm -hmm. because my English was good at the time, mm -hmm. uh, and I I found jobs in the hotels with tips to one of my friends. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really wanted to work as a as a waiter, but. Uh, my friend from Macedonia, he told me one day that, so what, what, what I was doing because uh, you know we lived in the in 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 Rehoboth Beach and mm -hmm. it only worked during the season. Mm -hmm. uh, so after the season, I mean after twenty days, the season started. Everyone, all the uh, employers would uh, train their students and prepare them for the season and they do not mm -hmm. hire they didn't hire so he told me to find a decent job and uh, make money until I went because uh, we went there for four or five months right and I understood uh, and I accepted uh, what he told me and then the the next day I tried to find a job I couldn't find any job Except one place, uh, who I mean, which which, uh, which really needed a dishwasher. So I uh, wanted to work as a waiter, but ended up being a dishwasher in my as as my second job. And I worked for two days, mm -hmm. uh, and then they changed my my position to the busboy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I worked one more month and I asked to be a waiter mm -hmm. and he asked me to to learn the menu to learn mm -hmm. the ingredients and luckily it was uh, much easier because uh, the second I mean uh, uh, th that place was a breakfast restaurant so it was easier for me to learn the ingredients because most of the things I knew mm -hmm. like eggs sausages yeah. right but and they have a lot of bacon really needed to know the types of cooking uh -huh. like scrambled egg uh -huh. Uh, like sunny side up, uh -huh. so hard, easy. Right. And what's your favorite one? Scrambled egg. It's scrambled eggs. It's cheese, uh -huh. yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What kind of cheese? Uh, any. You just add it. And right. It gives different a, flavor. A different flavor. Yeah. Right. I remember when I was working there as a waiter one time, I screwed up big time. So I had this big party, probably like seven, eight people, and they ordered bunch of appetizers and, and expensive dishes for main course and then some dessert, right? And, and I'm taking all their order and they ordered some small pizzas for appetizers, right? And I go in to put in the order on the computer and at the time, I don't know what kind of cheese goes on pizza. So I thought it was American pizza, American cheese, because because it was in the U.S. because it was America, not realizing that they normally use mozzarella on pizza. Mm -hmm. So I placed order an order for small pizzas with American cheese, and the chefs were all surprised. Like, are you sure they want the American cheese on their pizza? I'm like. At the time, I'm new, right? And I'm trying to sound confident. I don't want to sound like an amateur. Yeah, 100%. Go for it. Go ahead. And then they make small pizzas with American cheese, right? And I take it to them, and they all look at it with, with a face of surprise. And they're 
they all sort of discussed it. And they look at me and say, what is this? I say, that's your order, <laughs> right? You've ordered a very small pizzas, right? But what's that on top of the pizza? I say, that's cheese. And then they look back at me and they say, can, can I talk to the manager, please? <laughs> they usually do that. They usually do that. Anything wrong, they instantly ask you to bring the manager. And, and they did. And the manager gave me that face that made me think I was going to get fired that day. But luckily, I didn't. They cut me some slack. And I got away with it. They trashed all those pizzas. And they got them some different pizzas. But I had to pay for those pizzas. Oh. Yeah. They, they kept it from my pay. Hmm. Right. So working at a Mexican restaurant, did you like the food there? How did, how did you like their food? Uh, what, what does Mexican food taste like? Uh, and what would you say to that embassy counselor, the lady, after you have tried the, after you tried the Mexican food? Very good question. I like their Mexican food mm-hmm. a lot. It, you know, um, what I see, what I, how I explain mm. would be like in, in Central Asia or in Asia, our food has its own uh, reputation, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the same thing there in the American uh, continent. So Mexican food has its own uh, reputation. Mm-hmm. Uh, like their food, burritos, no? mm-hmm. and, uh, tacos. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mexican food has a taste. But uh, I, I tried some at some restaurants. I, I tried some steaks at some restaurants. I, okay, it sounds great. It's a steak. It sounds great. But meat, it is, right? It is meat. It, so it is must be tasty. In, a, in an American restaurant. But I, what I say is that uh, their meat, their food, the American, has uh, its... You know, flavor with spices. Mm-hmm. Our meat has its own flavor, mm-hmm. but theirs with spice. You know, mm-hmm. after, after if 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 you do not eat your meat for, I mean, do not eat your food for, uh, for an hour, so it looks bad and tastes really bad. Mm-hmm. But here, the food. Mm-hmm. Is organic. Maybe it's because it's organic. Mm-hmm. Our food tastes bad. And look, mm-hmm. looks. Uh, sorry, our food tastes very good, and it it looks very good. Mm-hmm. Right. There's not that much. I didn't like American. Yeah. I liked some of the Mexican food, mm-hmm. but not American. You know, when I was in the U.S., I I loved American food. Because I was always hungry, <laughs> right? I'd, I'd get to have meal only once a day. I'd work the entire day and I'd only have dinner or lunch and nothing more. So every time I would get, get to have How about their food, food, right? So I tried their burgers. I tried their uh, pasta. I tried, I tried their, what else did I try? Fries, chicken nuggets, right? Mostly fast food and a little bit of pasta. And that was about it. And every time I try food, I'd be so starving that I wouldn't care if there was no flavor. I just all I, I'd care about was filling my belly. I, I worked at two different restaurants, uh-huh. so I had free meal all the time. Oh, you did. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, did my, you put on weight after that experience? No, 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 I lost weight uh-huh. because I worked a lot. I, uh-huh. I think I used a lot of calories. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but my friend who worked at a McDonald's then. Mm-hmm. He, um, w- w- when I said, let's try some McDonald's food, he said, no, mm-hmm. don't, p- because he knew what kind of ingredients they were adding. So mm-hmm. uh, I couldn't have a chance. I, I mm-hmm. didn't uh, try McDonald's. Mm-hmm. So McDonald's food. We don't have any McDonald's in Uzbekistan, do we? I don't think we do. Yeah, we got KFC. We got KFC. We got Wendy's. I saw Wendy's. Uh, some Wendy's in Tashkent. But Wendy's is not as popular as KFC. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The other day I went to next shopping mall. Mm-hmm. I saw the, a lot of people with mm-hmm. their long queue mm-hmm. uh, near the KFC mm-hmm. stand, but 
the Wendy's were empty. Mm -hmm. Right. Not a person. Not right. a single person. But it's a big brand in the U.S. It is a big brand. It is okay. a really big brand. What I think is that as a uh, business person, mm -hmm. I think what KFC is giving to people uh, gives more value uh, compared to the money they pay. But Wendy's mm -hmm. is not giving that value. So our people want more for less money. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, Wendy's, I haven't tried Wendy's food mm -hmm. in, in, in Tushkin. Uh, I believe their food must have some quality. Mm -hmm. But maybe th they're not giving the, mm -hmm. the, the portion right. Or mm -hmm. maybe uh, they're giving less value to their product than mm -hmm. the KFC. For KFC, you know, for 90,000 or 100,000, you can get a basket of mm -hmm. uh, chicken legs. Mm -hmm. That is enough for mm -hmm. three, four people. So this is a value. So you 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 feel that you're paying, uh, you're getting the product with more value than you're paying. Mm -hmm. You see, this is what KFC is doing. That's why KFC has many customers. Right, right. Yeah, you're right, though. This is about the value. Uh -huh. So when you're selling something, you have to add value. Mm -hmm. People... Pay for the value, mm -hmm. right? Right, right, right. Yeah, totally right. Totally right. Uh, I think I, I actually like traditional fast food chains more than international brands because they offer a lot more for your for for your money. They're they're they, you get a good bang for your buck yeah. with traditional fast food, right? For about like fifty thousand zooms, you get really satiating food mm -hmm. satiating dishes but with kfc with i tried kfc once but i got i got little food for lots of money but i thought it was just a ripoff so i mm -hmm. promised myself i was never gonna, never gonna try kfc again mm -hmm. right I, I i i buy the uh -huh. big baskets with uh -huh. my friends so it's always worth it but if you think about hundred thousand zooms it's still a lot of money right for hundred thousand zooms you can get uh, like five a shower mass or something, mm -hmm. right? No, but or, in, or does it not, work out the same? Tashkent. Not in not, Tashkent. Not in Tashkent. Here in Bukhara, though, you can get five shower mass for. I'm comparing <laughs> the prices in Bukhara. Tashkent. Tashkent. Yeah. Big difference, right? Not the best idea. All right. What do you say? We talk a little about your more recent work experience now. So, uh, starting with your. Experience working at the Knowledge Academy. What was it like working with Mr. Ferdows? Oh, working with... I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a brilliant guy. I have so much respect for him. He was on the show once. Mm. And, 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 and when he was on, on the show, I, something terribly went wrong. Before the show, uh, I went to see him. We had a long talk about how the show was going to be like and I, I and I and I got him so excited, pumped up about this podcast. It's gonna be big. Uh, everyone is gonna want to watch us together. It's gonna be the best, the coolest uh, duo or the crossover. Or please come on the show. And I finally get him on the show. And we sit down and talk for about two two and a half hours. And after the we're done shooting, we realize his mic wasn't working for about an hour. <laughs> and wow. I didn't know how to break it to him. And I'm in so much disappointment right and, and embarrassment and shame i don't know what to say so i wait until he leaves <laughs> and then i and, and a few days later i reach out and, and text text him sorry your mic wasn't recording that day we got only about an hour of the audio the other audio is going to be the, the camera's audio so i hope that was not that's not going to be a problem and but, but he, he was nice. He, he said that technical problems happen. It's totally okay. And I promised him that we'd do part two with him sometime in March again. Like mm -hmm. next year, March, 2025, March. Yeah, I want my podcast now. On his birthday. Oh, when is his birthday? On March the 17th. Actually, we did it the day before his birthday. Or it was on, on his birthday. I don't really remember. The day before his birthday. It was the day before his birthday. Yeah. 
Ja, ja, ja. Mein Weg. Oh, it didn't go exactly, exactly, right, right, right. We did it the day before his birthday, or on the day of his birthday. I don't remember, honestly. The day before his birthday. Otherwise, I would have got him some gift, right? If it was his birthday that day, right? We did, we did that. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, we're planning to have him on the podcast once again next year, sometime around his birthday, f to celebrate our one-year anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> and that screw up and that yeah, mistake. Sometimes things work for for the good. Yeah, right. So what is it like working with Mr. Ferdows? Well, working with Mr. Ferdows has taught me a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing is uh, that working with him, I have learned to be result-oriented. Mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, I mean, whatever the situation is, you have to show results you have to um, you know reach your goals so mm -hmm. uh, if, if you if you make plans if you put deadlines uh, you you have to do them until the deadlines if so you cannot do so stretch and do it again so do mm -hmm. not give up mm -hmm. so this is another thing that I learned from him is uh, not to give up mm -hmm. so uh and I, I i i know a little poem so uh that i learned uh from one of the books but uh this is how you work with him mm -hmm. so for every solution under the sun there is a uh, for every problem under the sun there is a solution or there is not if you uh if there is one find a, seek until you find it mm -hmm. if there is none then never mind it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, interesting. working with him uh -huh. i learned to solve any problem that mm -hmm. you come across with. Mm -hmm. so, so he taught you to be more solution-minded yes solution-minded so solution driven do not complain mm -hmm. this is another thing mm -hmm. so when you work with him do not complain so mm -hmm. you have to do your best Uh, and I, I, I admit, mm -hmm. I learned a lot of things from him. Mm -hmm. uh, he comes across a little as a secret agent guy. <laughs> He's very quiet in the way he talks and very observant, paying attention. Yeah. Like he, he's, he's the most unassuming guy. Yeah. You never expect him to be this powerful, but he is. Like he never brags about it or he's very, he's very down to earth, right? Mm. Right. Uh, he 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 looks very simple, uh -huh. uh, but he is one of the most intelligent people uh -huh. I know. Yeah, uh, and you know he he knows what he does. Mm -hmm. Even uh, I mean he studied literature, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. He his his main uh, his key thing is teaching. But, mm -hmm. uh, he did really well mm -hmm. uh, when he was the head of the. Mm -hmm. uh, the presidential school in Bukhara, and mm -hmm. whatever he does, he does it to his to his best. Mm -hmm. This is what I like about it. Mm -hmm. So he focuses on 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 thing. And now he's an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. He has his own private schools, mm -hmm. uh, and he's doing really uh, really well. Mm -hmm. Because when we opened the school, we had only. 32, 50 students. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. don't remember the exact numbers, but now mm -hmm. they're one of the one of the uh, big private schools mm -hmm. in in the city. One of the biggest private schools in the city with around 400 students. Mm -hmm. That's quite big. This is that, it is a big and and I heard recently they branched out. They got a branch in yes in Vakant. one of the districts here, right? Uh huh. They opened the branch in mm -hmm. Vakant, uh Going region. fast. Yeah. There must be, I, I do not remember, I, I do not know the mm -hmm. number, so. Uh, mm -hmm. But they have a good number of students. What is your own personal experience of running a school like? Hmm. Running a language school. Yeah, right. Um, so you run the school called Gravity, right? Yeah, Gravity. Also. Well, why did you decide to call it Gravity? 
Is it, is it because of the school's pull? It pulls you like gravity? To tell the truth, uh -huh. I am, I consider myself as an old school mm -hmm. uh, man because I never believed or never used any names or any brands mm -hmm. uh, as my school uh, name. So people knew me. Mm -hmm. So as a teacher, so they brought their kids to Mr. Oybek. Mm -hmm. or to Oybek David Khajaev. Mm -hmm. So they didn't bring it. Then I realized that uh, if, if you connect the school to your own name, then people will, people will continue to come to you, not to the school. So I decided to uh, delegate some of the mm -hmm. tasks to my to to my family members and to to the teachers so my wife my sister and my uh, sister-in-law works there mm -hmm. work there um, and some other teachers so I they they have come up with an uh, with a name and they put gravity LC mm -hmm. actually there was one of the options was Ed Astra oh really yeah. all right who came up with that idea my my sister in law came up, uh -huh. came up with an idea because we taught English and math uh -huh. as, and and she was considering okay uh -huh. let's call it Ed Astra because we have two uh -huh. like uh, subjects to teach we we uh -huh. have math and we mm -hmm. have English so let, let and what do these subjects have to do with Ed Astra how how are these two subjects connected subjects and the name Ed Astra connected so Ed Astra means two stars right mm -hmm. so yeah two. Uh, subjects and we kind of connected mm -hmm. and then uh, they we, we ended up with gravity LC uh -huh. so in uh, I gave some of my groups to mm -hmm. the teachers now I only have two mm -hmm. groups one math one English just because I like teaching mm -hmm. um, running a language school uh, it is one of the toughest business types, I would say, because, uh, you know, let, let me explain this in this way. So uh, now you have a language school. You understand me mm -hmm. very well. Uh, I have a language school. Now. We have problems with the staff. Mm -hmm. We have problems in finding a decent teacher, mm -hmm. finding a, uh, an experienced teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, or if, even if you find there might be some trust issues mm -hmm. or if you prepare, if you train uh, anyone to be a teacher, so you need at least one and a half, two years mm -hmm. right, to, to prepare a very good teacher. Uh, so we have problems with the staff finding good candidates, mm -hmm. uh, uh, finding good employees. But uh, whereas, let, let's consider um, shopping malls mm -hmm. or uh, like uh, stores, right? So when they hire, they can train their employee, uh, employees like for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And they can start work right away. You see? Uh, another thing is that you, I mean, uh, as the language school, you have to work with uh, with your client for from like four months, as you told. Mm -hmm. uh, if if your course is four months course, mm -hmm. from four months to a year or to one and a half or two mm -hmm. sometimes two or three years mm -hmm. with the same client. Mm -hmm. So you have to uh, tolerate. Mm -hmm. You have to. Uh, learn mm -hmm. you have to understand you have to um, uh, you have to know what in, in what kind of family he or she lives in mm -hmm. uh, but whereas if you have a another type of business like store so your clients come they buy they pay mm -hmm. so business is over mm -hmm. with that client mm -hmm. so next time he or she comes another different business starts right but in our case, it's a little different. Yeah. So this is the hard things mm -hmm. with the language school. 
Right, right. We're not. So you need dedicated people. Mm -hmm. If you if you want your language school work uh, works well, if you if you want your language school to work well, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, I can totally relate to what you're saying here. It is no walk in the park running a big school, yeah. especially when you're dealing with people. They got all these problems. <laughs> but if you're selling, so uh, we work with. Uh, this is a service. Mm -hmm. type of, I mean, you you serve people. Mm -hmm. You teach them mm -hmm. uh, language, right? So service is always dif difficult, mm -hmm. uh, more difficult than selling products. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's yes. not like sitting at the ticket office and selling tickets, right? It's it's a lot harder and a lot more complicated and complex. So this is what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, everything okay? So uh, now what do you say we talk as well about your experience of working at presidential school, right? What is it like working there? I've heard a lot of great things from other people I've had on the podcast so far. So uh, do you feel the same way about the school? Mm, yes, I do. And um, working at an international school like that is really fun. And mm -hmm. is everything? Yeah, yeah it's all it's all good. Uh, wor working at an international school is uh, really mm -hmm. uh, challenging and mm -hmm. fun at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot of new things, and I think I learned. Uh, even in teaching, I learned many things. I, I've had chances to attend international trainings, international conferences, forums uh, uh, organized by our agency and ministry. So they gave me a lot of things. So I started my... Uh, job there as a math teacher first. We went to Tashkent before we before I started my job there, we went to Tashkent for almost 15 days uh, to attend a training to be able to teach under the Cambridge curriculum. You know, we use hybrid curriculum, so uh, STEM and national curriculum, STEM subjects are taught by under the uh, Cambridge curriculum and the other subjects, uh, the local subjects are taught uh, based on the national curriculum. So uh, like history, native language. So that the, there are some differences in teaching math, for example. Uh, so I, I share my experience based on uh, my subject. So. Mm -hmm. It is similar with other subjects as well. So we, in in our national curriculum, we teach math uh, on on a linear path. So you you for example, you know, let's say you learn um, fractions in our national curriculum. So you you ne never come back to fractions. Mm -hmm. you, know, you learn percentages. You never come back. So linear, step by step, you learn all the uh, all the topics, right? But uh, their curriculum is kind of spiral. Mm -hmm. So uh, you on on on. I mean, your fifth grade on your fifth grade, you learn fractions, percentages, uh, probabilities. Uh, suitable to your grade and next year you learn these things uh, more with uh, with a little complicated uh, questions and next year more and next year so this spiral mm -hmm. so at the end of the day in the long run uh, the Cambridge curriculum proves itself mm -hmm. All right, so you get to taught the same concepts on different levels yes. over the grades. Yes, over the grades. It's mm -hmm. spiral. You go, go. You learn the mm -hmm. same sub, the same topic, mm -hmm. but with m more details every year. You see, this mm -hmm. is what I like. So lower secondary mm -hmm. one run, and IGCSE another, and AS and A level mm -hmm. another. At the end of the day, so uh, you learn many things. 
Right. At the beginning, our national curriculum proves itself. So the pupil knows many things in, in one topic. But at the end of the day, so he or she might forget or he or she might feel embarrassed to ask questions uh, about the topic from his or her teacher. But in the Cambridge curriculum, you come back to the topic. Mm -hmm. And does it allow enough time to cover all concepts in math, like many of the major yeah. concepts in, in, in math? Like because if you're learning the same thing over and over and over again. So you said you primarily focus on uh, fractions, no, percentages, or those, I, those I are just examples. Example. Examples, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you do get taught At all, the all I, I same concepts. I didn't like the Cambridge curriculum, mm -hmm. to tell you the, the truth. Uh, but later, uh, with, with the experience, with, with teaching, and with the students' results, I understood that uh, w with Cambridge curriculum, uh, I mean, we need to focus on Cambridge curriculum. We, need, we, we, we have a lot of things to learn from their curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, so the students, w when they're uh, taught based on Cambridge curriculum, they, they will have a chance to come to the topic so until they graduate from high mm -hmm. school, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but in, in our national mm -hmm. curriculum, so you'll, you'll not have the chance or you mm -hmm. have to attend special courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. I see? Yeah. So you review the same concept several times. Mm -hmm. so but that with helps. More details every, yeah. every time you learn it. Right, and that helps consolidate information you gain over time, uh, making your knowledge solid. Mm -hmm about that particular concept or subject, yes. right, which proves more effective than teaching students a bunch of different concepts, but on surface level, yeah. right? And what I like, another thing I like about the Cambridge curriculum is that uh, they are, th there are more uh, word problems and which, which uh, helps you to train I mean, and to not not train, but to prepare develop sort of your uh -huh. uh, critical thinking. Uh -huh. uh, so you 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 think, but uh, our questions used to be like with the formula. Mm -hmm. You use the formula, you come up with the idea. Mm -hmm. Now our national curriculum is also changing, mm -hmm. which is good. But before mm -hmm. we had simple questions. Uh, before you needed to learn the formula uh, and you needed to learn how to use that mm -hmm. to get to an answer that like like 36 tests if you remember yeah right right yeah but now it's 30 right they it made it 30, 30. So they made it 30 cool you're not working as a math teacher there anymore i guess no so this year, Mr. Ferdow stepped down as the school principal, and I'm guessing you took his position. Yeah. Right? In, I started my position. job there uh, October 2021 mm -hmm. as the math teacher. And uh, September 2022, uh, we, uh, they, they started to teach business. Mm -hmm. And I was the one with the business administration diploma mm -hmm. uh, and with a decent IELTS score. So mm -hmm. they, Mr. Firdaus asked me to teach business mm -hmm. and I changed my job uh, from math teacher to a business teacher. And I taught for six months mm -hmm. from September 2022 until March 2023. And uh, starting from first of Ma March in 2023, uh, I became the school counselor mm -hmm. and I worked there for one year and yes, exactly one year. In 2024, April, uh, Mr. Firdas decided to leave the school uh, to so that he had more time to work on his uh, projects uh, in his own private school. So mm -hmm. I, I went to Tashkin. I worked in the agency for almost a month. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in, in February. And then from 
uh, the beginning of April this year, I am running the school. No, officially yeah. running the school. Yeah. So, and how does it feel to be the head of that school? It, does it feel overwhelming? Because now you got a lot of responsibilities and so many people looking to you for answers. Yeah, it is a lot of responsibility. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I do not complain. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I took this responsibility and mm -hmm. have to do my best. Mm -hmm. uh, the responsibility is that we have the international staff mm -hmm. living in the school campus. We have 168 students living in the school campus. Mm -hmm. So uh, any technical problem or any problems in the maintenance. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, their education, the, the atmosphere, keeping the atmosphere mm -hmm. uh, like alive mm -hmm. is uh, sometimes challenging, you know. Uh, but I'm doing my best. Um, sometimes I stay at school mm -hmm. uh, at night so that to to see how mm -hmm. the process is going. Uh, luckily, we have a very good team. Mm -hmm. Very good team. They they know what they're doing. But still, uh, it is a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So for those students who are trying to get into that school, what are some suggestions you have for them? Say I have a, um, I have a friend who's in fifth grade or I have, I have a, my future kids say I want to send them to presidential school. So uh, what do you want them to do in t with respect to their preparation or their, I, I guess, school grades, G GPA, if they want to be able to get into the school? Because I, I, I've heard a lot of things about the school, and, and I've also heard that it's very competitive. It is competitive. Mm -hmm. It is more competitive than mm -hmm. uh, most of the universities in Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. uh, our statistics is that mm -hmm. 24 students are accepted uh, out of 3,000. Out of 3,000? Candidates. And in percentages, that roughly how much is it? It's 0. 0.0. Something. something. And that's less 0. than... 0.008? That's less than 1%. Less than 1%. It's harder to get into a PS school than it is to get into Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Harvard has higher acceptance rate. Yeah. Their acceptance rate is something like 5 6%, I guess. Okay, let's right. say one, even, even though it's 1%, right? Yeah. It is, mm -hmm. it is hard. So my first suggestion to parents, mm -hmm. would be, it is a very good place to study. It mm -hmm. is uh, uh, the place where I see mm -hmm. dedicated both international and mm -hmm. local teachers. They're mm -hmm. all dedicated. Uh, it is, but the kids should be psychologically ready mm -hmm. because they live far from their parents, mm -hmm. far from their families. Mm -hmm. So my first advice would be to prepare your kids mm -hmm. uh, psychologically so that they could live mm -hmm separately from their parents. And what can they do as part of that preparation? Like, uh, so, have uh, them live with their uncle for a few months <laughs> <laughs> away from home? Uh, I guess that would help. You, you need to, you need to make your kid, I mean, you, you need to prepare them to be more independent. Mm -hmm. So I would say maybe, uh, do I mean let them do some tasks independently? Mm -hmm. Let them make mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, let them feel more independent. This is first thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second thing is that they 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 need to understand. The parents need to understand that the the kids once they leave far from the families, they need to understand that uh, they they have they will have difficulties they will have uh, their problems so uh, they should let them solve their own problems because uh, we'll have we have some of the parents uh, that they come mm -hmm. so every day and we, mm -hmm. we tell them not to come every day mm -hmm. right because that will uh, 
that will make it difficult for the kid to adapt to the to the school life. Right. So you want them to be as independent as possible. Yes. But but uh, I'd imagine like we don't really need much independence when you're a PS school student because you guys have a lot of rules and restrictions and it's not like kids going out there and trying things on their own when they got surveillance 24/7 and teachers telling them when to go to bed, when to wake up, right? Do you still think you really need that independent independence? Because I don't ever see them leave the school parameters, leave the school school territory. Yes. So they're being they're guarded twenty four seven. Mm -hmm. uh, it is because of their safety. Uh huh. So now imagine you you are taking the responsibility of one hundred and sixty eight students. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot just let them mm -hmm. walk out of the school at any mm -hmm. time they want or come mm -hmm. back to school at right. any time. But with uh, with the teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, with the international staff, with the local staff, uh, we let them go to a different. Mm -hmm. I personally, I let them go to uh, different places in mm -hmm. the city. Uh, I let the international staff to take some of the students out mm -hmm. for dinner, for um, like, for example, the futsal mm -hmm. championship. The, we we have our our own bus, so mm -hmm. we took. Um, several students to the futsal, I mean, those who were interested. Mm -hmm. I want them to feel free in the school. I want them to uh, go to different places as much as possible, but still we have the responsibility uh, before the parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point, good point. So you would, you would send your own kid to the school? You would want your own kid to study in this boarding I school. I would, but my parents don't. <laughs> <laughs> my parents not gonna be okay with that because yeah. they like their grandkids too grandkids much. Grandkids too much. <laughs> right, right. It is a good place uh -huh. to study, though. It is a good place to develop as a as a mm -hmm. person. Uh, I'm I'm doing my best to mm -hmm. give our students uh, as much freedom as I want, but mm -hmm. still we have rules. Uh, sometimes, you know. I have to make the decisions which I do not. So some of our students understand that, some of them don't. Uh, I, sometimes I barely say no mm -hmm. because I do not want, because if, uh, if it's in my family, I would say yes. But uh, in the school campus, sometimes I have to say no just because of their safety, just mm -hmm. because uh, of their well-being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're, you're very caring. You're a very thoughtful principal. They're lucky to have you. They're very lucky. I, to I have try you. to be. Yeah. But sometimes yeah. I I have to say no to some uh, to some mm -hmm. points. Yeah, even if that makes it, that makes them not like you. Yeah. yeah you're just doing just, what's just in their between, best interest. Yeah, just between you and me. So yeah. I ask them. So shall I answer your, to your question as a brother uh -huh. or as a principal? Mm -hmm. And based on their answer, I, I, I mm -hmm. tell them. I answer their question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. At least you're not like you're not that strict, like like some of those ball buster principals who who say it's either my way or the highway. You're not at mm -hmm. least like one of those. You give them options, which is good, which is good. I, I, I try to be, mm -hmm. I try to, still, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you, you understand me, mm -hmm. because you have students, you have staff, sometimes mm -hmm. you have to say no to mm -hmm. some things, even if you do not want to say no, mm -hmm. uh, just because there are rules, because mm -hmm. uh, of the safety, because of mm -hmm. the, for example, uh, let me bring an example of uh, eating yeah, yeah. Right? what happened? Uh, eating food outside. Mm -hmm. uh, I say no to those kids who want to bring pizzas. Mm -hmm. Why? I, I do not want to say no, but I have to say no. The first thing is that uh, I do not want some of the students to feel 
uh, In, to be, to inferior. Be left, yeah, to be left. Uh -huh. So some 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 students can afford to buy pizza every day, but uh -huh. some students cannot. Another point is that we we provide them uh, with food five times a day, and if they eat something wrong, uh, something that mm -hmm. went bad, right? So and they might uh, feel sick. So that is that would be my responsibility again. You see, uh, so we have to. I have to make some decisions. Uh, just because of their safety. Yeah. Just because they will be. Right. Even if they don't like it. Yeah. Right. They don't like it. But mm -hmm. sometimes I, I allow them. Like on, on, the, par on, on the holidays, mm -hmm. on some uh, parties, mm -hmm. but with limit. Right. Right. Yeah, sure. And if those PS students watching this podcast right now, you would not want to lose this man as your I hope they yeah, principal, right? You would want to have them. He's trying to do what's in your best interest. He's looking out for you guys. Now, he's, not, he's not your enemy. He's not against you. Yeah, right. All right, so before we wrap up this podcast episode today, which has been nothing short of enjoyable, personally. Well, what do you say we talk a little about philosophy? So we have kind of a tradition here on the podcast where we end things on a philosophical note. I'll be asking you a set of questions that would that, that are going to make you really think. Mm -hmm. So what is your philosophy, personal philosophy? What drives you? What drives me? Yeah, what is your mission on this planet? Yeah, or this plane in the universe. That is a very big question. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, these questions are gonna make you think. So I believe that every single person is born with a mission. Mm -hmm. uh, helping people in any ways. Mm -hmm in any ways I can, mm -hmm. I, is my mission. And I have uh, seen this as my mission. Because uh, yes, it is true that I worked for money for a couple of years at the beginning of my career in Tashkent. But later on, I understood that uh, running after money is not is not something I wanted because you know, my with my students' results, with with people coming to me thanking me, uh, if if I helped, you know, uh, it gives me a different different satisfaction, you know. So I accept this, like helping people, um, as much as I can. Mm -hmm. In any ways, right now I'm. Uh, I mean, until now, I helped people with my teaching, with my experience, with my English, with my math. I helped them to uh, apply for the university, the universities they wanted. I helped them with my own life experience. Uh, sometimes I'm 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 a very good shoulder to cry on. Mm -hmm. uh, people tell about their problems, and I listen. Just listening to people is a great deal of help uh, and giving them advice even if they do not follow that but still listening to them and helping them is your life's is, mission is my satisfaction is yeah. my I accept this as my mission huh. yeah that's quite deep that's quite deep just helping and then that's very selfless, altruistic. And I wish the world had more people like you. <laughs> yeah. It'd be a lot Thank different. You. It'd be a lot different. So oh, what's something you want to say to a lot of young people watching us right now? So what's a pe one piece of advice you would want to give them? Or you would want to give your younger self? My younger self? Or mm -hmm. Are all of the young people watching us right now?
Um, I like this part a lot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that that there is not one thing that I would. There are many things, but mm-hmm. uh, what I the first one of the first things I would tell my younger self or people watching me to so do whatever you do with quality, mm-hmm. with I mean uh, with dedication, and everything works. Mm-hmm. Every single thing. There mm-hmm. is there is nothing that people cannot do. Mm-hmm. You can do everything. Right. That reminds me of a scene from a movie called Green Book or something. There's a scene where a, a white guy is driving a black guy who plays the piano. And he says, my dad had this, gave me this advice when I was really young. Whatever you do, do it 100%. If you're eating, eat 100%. If you're sleeping, sleep 100%. Well, I, I haven't watched it, but I, I will watch it. Green Book, yeah. It's, it's, it, it's more about like social justice and racial issues, mm-hmm. right? About, you know, oppression of black people and persecution of minorities and whatnot. Yeah, and the scene, I just got reminded of that scene when you said do it 100%. It says, hey, if, you, if you're eating, eat 100%. If you're sleeping, sleep 100%. If you want to help someone, help someone 100%. Whatever you do, do it 100%. Right, with, he, with the messages you release, try to be mindful, mm. mindful, present in what you're doing and do it to the best you can. Mm. As, so if, if you're having food, eat it as though it's your last meal. Mm. If you're helping someone, help them as though you're helping the last person in your entire life. Mm. If you're talking to someone, talk to them as though they're the last person you're talking to. Yeah. And you live zero regret life. Yeah, right. for sure. You know, uh, one of my friends from america told me that mm-hmm. uh he, he he was an atheist but he mm-hmm. told he 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 used to help uh everyone mm-hmm. you know and he told me whatever religion mm-hmm. exists mm-hmm. he said uh, i'm doing good things mm-hmm. i'm not doing any bad mm-hmm. so uh whatever you do whatever uh whoever you help do it with quality, do it with dedication. And mm-hmm. uh, the, the, sometimes, you know, if, if, if you help or if you try to help, people might misunderstand, people might talk bad things about you, but still accept these uh, and, and do not mind about them. Just do it what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And... With uh, with their careers, with their studies, with uh, the life choices, so you have to take some risks, mm-hmm. some smart risks, though. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I regret that uh, I didn't take some risks, but taking even if you make mistakes. Make mistakes. Do not feel afraid of your mistakes because mistakes you either you 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 learn from your mistakes. It's a good thing. It's just you have to look at the mistakes as as lessons. This is what I learned. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. All useful advice. We always wish we knew these things early on, early in life. And we ponder sometimes how our lives would be different if we knew those things all along, mm. right? Right. Imagine this podcast is right now being watched by your future self. Mm-hmm. And you're probably going to come back and watch this podcast when it's out. <laughs> so, or, or your future, future self, like your uh, 40-year-old self or 50-year-old self wanting to reminisce all days. So what's one message you have for that guy? And you can look at the camera right now. He's watching, watching <laughs> us. <laughs> right? Mm. So something you would want to say to that guy. What can you tell? Yeah, your future self. I highly likely you'll be watching this podcast or you won't. Uh, I, I, I believe that mm-hmm. people, as they, as they grow older, they become smarter. Mm-hmm. They become uh, wiser. Mm-hmm. More mature, self-aware. More mature, yeah, and 
I did not know what to say to that. Yeah. <laughs> Smarter or wiser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but hope this podcast does not make you cringe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, the smarter version of him. Yeah, he, 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 I'm doing my best here. <laughs> I'm doing my best. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I promise that I will take care of my health. Uh-huh. And I promise to work on myself. Uh, and I hope that you will see the results. Yeah. 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 And you, you won't be disappointed. He's not going to let you down. <laughs> right. All right. So we have it on record now. Right. We have it. So you said it publicly. And we're most probably going to keep your promise. Right. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Th- th- thank you very much. Mm hmm. Uh, is this the end, or do you have any more questions? No, we, 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 that's this is normally how we end things here. Oh. I, it's been a pleasure. It's been a blast talk, having you on the podcast today and talking about all these things. And I am super, super appreciative of you coming here today, sharing with us all your life experiences, your insights, and letting us in on all these secrets about how things work at presidential school and all the pointers, tips, advice you gave. It means a lot to me. I'm sure it means a lot to our audience watching us right now. Thank you. I, I hope this mm-hmm. podcast will be interesting enough mm-hmm. for, uh, for, the, for mm-hmm. the audience. Mm-hmm. And uh, if they have any questions or if you have any questions, I'm open. Mm-hmm. So it is uh, a lot easier to find me. So with my phone, with my Telegram account. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, th- this this is a very. I'm, I'm going to tell uh, some of my opinions. Yeah, about, sure. About please. the podcast, this is a very good project, and mm-hmm. I liked it very much, and I'm really happy, uh, and I'm really honored uh, that. My, I am invited here. Thank you uh, for you, Mr. Muhammad Ali. And, oh, thanks. Uh, thank you. Th- thank you for the audience as well because they spend a part of their time uh, to to watch this, and I I hope that it it will be interesting enough for them. And uh, at the end of the podcast, I'm going to tell the audience uh, about this about the situation that changed me mm-hmm. forever mm-hmm. Uh, and it's about the time so um, what I, I I studied at high school I uh, took every everything seriously after this conversation with my uh, teacher, Mr. Abbas, uh, who is in Tashkent at the moment. Uh, I was in... I, I, if I remember that situation, I feel goosebumps, you know. Mm-hmm. I was in the class and I didn't prepare my homework uh, as usual. And what my uh, teacher's reaction was that, look at that time. Mm-hmm. It was... 9.15 in the morning. So this 9.15 does not come again, will not come back again. And I was shocked for a few minutes mm-hmm. because the time is the thing, thing that we lose every single moment if you do not use it right. But if you use it right, this is your wealth. And another thing is that when people... Um, sh- uh, when when people spend their time with you, uh, you I mean people need to I mean you have to accept this as the the greatest gift in life, because they're sharing something that cannot be reversed. So I would like the audience I would like to tell the audience to appreciate their time and to appreciate those who are sharing their time with them. Uh, because this is the greatest gift. This is the greatest gift, I think. So use your time cleverly. Yeah. This yeah. is the 
thing that I that changed me forever. And after this conversation with my teacher, I took everything seriously. Mm -hmm. And your life was never the same, <laughs> right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it changed the naughty boy to a... Mm -hmm. To the boy you see man. now, yeah, to a man, <laughs> right? I can't agree more with what you just said. Totally right. Time is precious. Time is valuable, and you have to make the most of it. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Time is the greatest gift, or the enemy. Mm -hmm. So choose it. How to accept? Right. All right. Once again, I I thank you a lot for coming on the podcast, coming on the show today, and I hope to see you more again. A few more times on the podcast. Oh. We're gonna be we're gonna be doing round two for sure, round two, round three, round four. Like every, every you know, to celebrate our anniversary. Hopefully okay. next year around this time, right? And I right, guess hope you enjoyed today's episode. And if you liked our content, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your comments in the comment section below. Okay. I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Great project. Good. Thanks.